Okay, y'all turn to Matthew 24. Um, while you're turning there, anybody watching and wants DVDs or you want all the classes every month on DVD or CD or you just want basics to hand out, anything like that, just let us know. We'll send it to you. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, redo something tonight that um, last I did last week and uh, it just we, we did a class in, uh, in Pensacola and it got deleted and I got a lot of questions asking me could we cover it and so we're going to do it again and um, it, it ain't you don't need to contact anybody about the fact that the class is deleted just don't worry about it. we're going to redo it right now and you can check all the scriptures out yourself okay in Matthew 24 we're just going to look verse uh, 12 Jesus is talking about things that are going to happen here now there's two things that they asked about the destruction of the temple and his coming again and he's answering both these questions but in verse 12 he says because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now we've all heard this, and I was taught something about it, and I taught it myself. And now tonight we're going to clear this up. This verse is used to say that Peter, James, John, and those that they preached to had to endure until the end to be saved. That they weren't saved when they believed after the cross that they had to endure, and if they didn't endure, that they wouldn't be saved. Uh, we, Y'all know I taught that, and I'm, yeah. okay? Yeah. All right, now, this is one of the verses that, that's used for it, right? If we would just go down, look at verse uh, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then what are we talking about being saved in the context? Are we talking about the salvation of people's spirits eternally? No. We're talking about anybody that's alive at the second coming is going to get delivered if they're believers, right? Yeah. Alright, so let's just take this and look at it. Now we're going to use Paul, okay? We're just going to take our time, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Basically, what we're going to have to do is, we're either going to have to decide, does everybody in Christ have eternal security, or in Christ is there two groups? One group in Christ who's saved and has eternal security, and another group who got into Christ, not by faith alone, but by faith plus works, and they can lose their salvation. Now, Wayne's already saying no. Wayne's using common sense. Huh? Unfortunately, I didn't use common sense when I was taught this. I just accepted it and taught it. But we're going to look at it. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right, I'm going to write this up here. Saved. What tense is that? Okay. Now that's past tense. What is he talking about that saved by grace through faith? What's saved right there? Saved yeah. No. Think about it, buddy. It's by faith. What what part of you saved? Your spirit. Wayne's got it spiritually. The person is saved, right? This is spirit. Tell you what, go over to uh, 1 Corinthians 5, just to, just to look at it. Um, 1 Corinthians 5. He's talking about a guy um, that, that's in the church, and he's uh, involved in a, in a fornication ritual, and it, he says to, something to do in verse 4. 1 Corinthians 5, 4, he's going to tell him to put him out of the assembly. He says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So at salvation, what is it that's saved? Spirit. spirit. What does the person receive the moment they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Salvation. You get salvation and it's spiritual by faith. It's words, isn't it? Hey, the moment a person trusts that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for their sins, lock, stock, and barrel. He was buried, sins buried. He's resurrected without sin. When the person believes that, something comes into them, doesn't it? Bible calls it the inner man, the new creature. It's spiritual. You can't see it, can you? 
The moment a person is saved, is this thing right here changed at all? No. No. The moment a person saved, is their <coughs> mind completely wiped clean? Yeah. No. No. There's just a change, right? Don't we still drag all our older religious yeah. ideas with us? Mm -hmm. We do, don't we? So Paul says this is saved, past tense, and he said right here, you saved by faith, right? Well, flip over to 1 Timothy 4. Alright, when we say the word saved, I got the definition here, I'll just read it to you. To preserve from injury, destruction, or evil of any kind, to rescue from danger. Now that's the basic meaning of saved. So saved involves being delivered from some kind of danger, doesn't it? Look, if you get saved from a fire, you get pulled out of the fire, right? If I jump in Mobile Bay with my blue jeans and boots on, I need somebody to save me, don't I? Save from drowning. Well, this saved right here is saved from what? Hell. Hell. Dying. Saved from hell and from perishing eternally without the Lord, right? Folks, this is salvation that we call it, isn't it? By faith. moment a person is saved, is that person delivered from hell? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that person got everlasting life? Yeah. They've got it, right? Mm -hmm. Past tense. It happened the moment they believed. Does everybody agree with that? Yep. So here's this person, and this person was saved right here this day, wasn't he? Okay? Now, 1 Timothy 4, verse 15. Paul says, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, every time we see the word save or salvation or redeemed or justified or sanctified, what's our mind apt to do? Talk about hell. That's Because look, that's the foremost thing in our mind, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He just told Timothy here that he will save. What tense is save? Present, Present tense, right? Okay. Present tense. Well... Is Timothy saved already? Yes. Then is Paul telling Timothy how to save himself again? No. no. Then what is Paul trying to tell Timothy? How to save himself from the trappings of false doctrine. Save himself from the false doctrine. Is false doctrine dangerous? Yeah. Yeah. Does a person need to be saved from it? Yeah. What's the only thing that can save you from it? True doctrine. True doctrine. So then what's Paul telling Timothy to do? Run. Stick save. to the doctrine, right? And you'll save yourself from all that heartache and bad doctrine that goes along with it. Plus, you'll save those that hear you, won't you? Mm -hmm. Now, he says to him in verse, uh, to see what he needed to be saved from, the whole chapter is, the context is chapter 4, verse 1. Watch what he says. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Then do you and I need to, after we're saved, study the Word of God in order that we'll be delivered from bad doctrine? Yeah. Where does this take place at? In your mind. In your mind. Okay. Now, saved in this case is saved from over here. It's hell and perishing. Over here, I'm going to put saved from uh, ongoing conditions. How about that? Is that okay with y'all? Alright? Now, is this salvation got anything to do with this one? Mm -mm. But can this one be obtained without this one? Mm -mm. It's God's will that all men be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth, isn't it? So Timothy here, anybody like him, they get saved right here, don't they? But then they embark on their life after salvation as a servant of the Lord. They don't drop dead that day, do they? Mm -mm. But they also don't get their hard drive wiped clean. They're going to have to study and work at this and learn to serve the Lord, learn to pray, learn to trust. All these things we go through. To show yourself approved. Show yourself approved, that's right. To show yourself approved is to do what? Study. To, to study, to figure out what is approved and what's not approved, right? So finally we come over here one day and old Timothy or whoever else hits the ground dead, don't they? Now... That same spirit, the second they die, it's still in them, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But where does that spirit go when they die? It goes to be with the Lord. But do they get a brand new body that day? 
No. So from the moment they're saved, they begin walking by faith, and they need to save themselves from all that bad doctrine, don't they? Okay, let's look at it one other way. Go back to chapter 2. Chapter 2, 11. <laughs> All right, he says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. All right, when Satan tempted Eve, could Eve have saved herself a lot of heartache if she would have said, Hold on, let me get my husband. He's the one God spoke these words mm -hmm. to. She didn't do that, did she? Uh -uh. He says, verse 14, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she, the woman, shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, I've heard people say, see there, if she has good kids, she can she save from hell. <laughs> Folks, will that work? Mm -hmm. I don't care how you cut it, that won't work, will it? Keep it in the context. Every time you see saved, don't run off in, into your mind saved from hell. Is there something in this verse that the woman's being warned not to do? Usurp authority, right? Yeah. If she usurps authority over the man, is it going to cause some problems? Yeah. If she accepts her job God gave her as raising the children and running the house, will it save her from all the heartache of trying to wear the pants? Mm -hmm. Then that's a salvation for her, isn't it? Yeah. Not saved from hell, saved from all that heartache, right? right. It says continue in faith. Yeah. In that word. That, yeah. And, and, and that other stuff will be easier to do. It sure will if she continues in the faith. Now, what if she doesn't continue in the faith? She might be saved, but yet she doesn't continue in the faith. She's going to get into a lot of heartache and trouble, isn't she? Okay? So if she'll just accept her role in the partnership between her and her husband and raise the kids and teach them about the Lord and do her part, let him do his part, that'll be a, a better situation, right? Yeah. Okay. Go over to uh, Romans 5. Now remember, we're just using Paul here. And what we're doing is, we're, we're doing this in light of what uh, Matthew 24 says about enduring to the end to be saved. All right, Romans 5, 8, Paul says, But God commended His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood. Okay, what is that up here on the board? That's saved, isn't it? Being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Well, what is shall be saved? Going to. Yeah, what tense? Future. I'm just going to write, shall save. That's future, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, what did he say be saved from? Wrath. Wrath, right? Shall be saved. Now, what do y'all suppose this is over here that's going to be saved from wrath? What do we have so far? Spirit, Spirit. mind, body. body. Okay, let's put it up here. Now let's double check ourselves by the scripture. Go over to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Alright. <clears throat> we'll read 22 too. 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, people always say when you preach the gospel to them, you're telling me that you can just go do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Did Paul say here to abstain from the appearance of evil? Yeah. Is it because appearing in evil and sin will cause you to go to hell? No. Nope. No. Nope. Will it cost you at the judgment seat of Christ? Yeah. It'll ruin your, your test. It'll ruin everything about anything you're going to do in the Lord. Now, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God... So, this isn't a foregone conclusion if he's praying for it, is it? He's asking. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did Paul just pray for there? The, the entire 
salvation, being blameless, spirit, soul, oh, or mind, and body. and body. Then is each one going to go through some type of a process? Mm -hmm. It is. Okay. Now go over to um, I think I just let's to look at the blameless part. Back up to Philippians two. Now, where would you be found over here in the future? Here this guy is saved right here. He's got his entire life where he's supposed to be the Lord's servant. Then he dies. When will he be found with blame or without blame? At the judgment seat, At the judgment seat of Christ, right? We'll just draw it up here. Alright? We'll save people. When it says blameless, look, your sin's paid for you. Sin's not the issue. But... Will you be found with some blame and in need of rebuke at the judgment seat? Sure we will, folks. Me and you got some stuff fouled up. We've done some things. Look, we're going to answer what type of servant were we, right? Now, he says in uh, Philippians 2, verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, men recognize that there's something wrong in this verse. They say, well, you can't possibly work out your salvation from hell. You can't. Your work ain't got nothing to do with it, right? So they go to work with the words and they say that means let it work out of you. Well, that's fine if you want to talk about it and let it work out of you. But what did Paul tell Timothy to do here? Study. Stick to the truth so he could save himself. Do you reckon that from the time we're saved to the time we die, that we need to watch how we serve the Lord with fear and trembling? Yes. Folks, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. That ain't going to be all... Uh, how do they say? <laughs> yeah, well, it won't be... I mean, think about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, embarrassing. It, it will be embarrassing. I mean, seriously, you think about... I, I always think when I stand in front of the Lord, the very first thing that pops in my mind is all the time I wasted... I mean, you sh I got, should have been doing other things, right? Then I start to think about, I'm going to stand there and I'm going to look at other people here with me who I have taught something and it's wrong. And I'm going to watch them suffer loss because of something I did. Now, that's, that's, that, I don't, I don't want to face that, but I know I will. Okay, so he says in verse 13, For it is God which worketh in you, see, they're already saved, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So the moment this person gets saved, is Christ now in them? And what does that begin to motivate that person to do if they allow it? To serve the Lord. Doesn't it? Shouldn't it motivate us to talk to people about the Lord? It should be Christ working in us, shouldn't it? Now he says, verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that, like in order that, ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Can you picture in your mind Paul standing before the judgment seat of Christ and Timothy going first? And Paul sitting there watching Timothy and wanting Timothy to get all the fullest reward he can, right? Why? Because he taught him. He's the one that taught him, folks. This is his, this is his, his fruit of his labor, isn't it? Like checking his work. He's checking his work. That's exactly right. So then you've got the moment you're saved, you've got your service in the Lord, and you've got the moment you die, and we're all going to answer about our service, won't we? Okay, so then to be blameless is there. Now flip over to the next book, Colossians 1. Alright, there's really three verses that get used to say that uh, Peter and them did not have eternal security. One is what we just read in Matthew, that they got to endure until the end, they say, right? The other two are in Hebrews, chapter 3 and chapter 6, where it talks about if they fall away, right? And as soon as that word if, they say, see there, they can lose their salvation. But you say, okay, can we who are Gentiles under Paul's gospel lose our salvation, and they say, no way. Well, watch Colossians 1, uh, uh, 21. And you that were sometimes alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, 
if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereby Paul made a minister. Did Paul just say, you're saved if you stick to the doctrine till the end? Yep. It's what it seems like, isn't it? Is there any way that's what he's saying? Mm -hmm. What's he saying? He's saying that you're going to be saved from the trouble. Look. That's right. He's talking about this salvation. He said, it's possible for a saved person to appear at the judgment seat harmless, blameless, and without rebuke if they do what? Stick to the doctrine and study serve the Lord right. Do you suppose, just, I'll talk about me. I know that I will not appear at the judgment seat of Christ without rebuke. I know there's some things I've done. There's some things I hadn't done. There's some things I taught. There's some things I hadn't taught. I know that I will be corrected at the judgment seat. Right? Mm -hmm. But, did the Lord give us everything we needed in order for it to be possible to be without blame? Yeah. He did. Now, this is what Paul was striving for. Flip back over to uh, Philippians 3. In Philippians 3, verse 10, Paul says this, he says, <clears throat> That I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, is there any way that Paul is saying here that he hopes he can work himself to a point where he'll be resurrected? That ain't possible. Mm -hmm. Is Paul going to be resurrected? Mm -hmm. Look, even if he's lost, there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. So there's no way he's saying he's hoping that at some point over here he'll be raised from the dead. That can't be what he's saying. He's already said that's a fact, right? Mm -hmm. Then what is he talking about trying to attain? What's attain mean? Yeah, to, to get something, right? How was Paul trying to serve the Lord? By spreading the word. By spreading the word. But in what in what sense is he saying it here? All right, what what is our you and our enemy in service? Flesh. Flesh. Then how was Paul trying to serve? Like his flesh was gone, like his flesh was changed. Paul's saying, I'm trying to serve, I'm trying to attain like I've been resurrected. That's my goal. Now, did he ever get it done? No. No. But was that a good goal? Yeah. So watch him read on, it'll make sense. Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, which he's already attained resurrection. He said either were already perfect, yet he said he made perfect in Christ. He said, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I, all, I also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I'm not thinking about yesterday. I'm going to serve today and try and today keep my mind on the Lord as if my flesh was already dead and I was a changed creature. Say, well, how did you do yesterday? Say, I don't want to talk about yesterday. I'm talking about what I'm going to do today. Every day of his life, how's Paul trying to serve the Lord? Like he's already been relieved of this burden. Now, ain't that a good goal? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, now let's see if Peter says the same thing. Uh, go over to 2 Peter 3. Second Peter three ten. <clears throat> Peter's talking about that the Lord is not slack concerning the promise that he's going to come back. In verse 10 he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What's he saying there? Since everything me and you is looking at, including these physical bodies, is going to be destroyed and gone, what should me and you be working towards? Eternal. Spiritual, eternal things, right? Verse 12. 
looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Where do you reckon Peter's talking about being found blameless? In Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. But you know what people do with that verse? They say, see, Peter and them had to live holy and righteous and keep the commandments in order to be saved and be found blameless. Didn't Paul just say we, could, we was gonna, wanted to be found blameless? Mm -hmm. How come Paul's salvation ain't the future deal? Are Peter and Paul saying the exact same thing there? They are. Mm -hmm. If you don't think Peter and Paul are saying the exact same thing, keep reading. And account that the long suffering, the tearing, the delay of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Is he saying that Paul said the same thing? Mm -hmm. Does it say there that Paul had written unto them? Yes. Ain't that what it says? Now y'all think about this. We've told all the time, and I've told you. Say, look, all the Bible's written for us, but all the Bible's not written unto us. We've all heard it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what are we told is written unto us? Romans through Philemon. Hebrews through Revelation, we say, is written for us, but not unto us. By that logic, Romans through Philemon is written for the Hebrews, but not unto them. Right? What did that say? Written unto them. Come on now, written unto them, isn't it? He says, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Now, everybody always says, see, Peter couldn't understand Paul's writings. Mm -hmm. Folks, read on. Mm -hmm. He don't say that at all. Watch what it says. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. This is used all the time to say Peter couldn't understand Paul's writings. He didn't say that. He said they that are unlearned struggle with Paul's epistles like they do the rest of the scriptures. Now watch the people he's writing to. Next verse. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before. Are these people struggling with them? Mm -hmm. They know it. That ye know these things before. Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Who put that in every letter he wrote? Paul did. Y'all see what Peter's telling them here? Okay. Go on over to, uh, well, we've done enough of that. Uh, did Paul talk about the judgment seat of Christ? Yes. Did Peter talk about yes. it? He just did. Let's watch him do it again. Go to 1 uh, Peter 4. Alright. According to Paul, who's going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ? Believers. Believers. Everybody that's what? In Christ. In Christ. Now, what do we call all the people that are in Christ? Body of Christ. What else we call them? House of God. Saints. Saints. Brethren. Brethren. Y'all you, getting more than I can write down. Uh, saints. How about Church of God? Okay. Brethren. I'm running, I'm running out of room. But is the Church of God going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ? Yeah. Right? Now he says here. 1 Peter 4, verse uh, 16. He said, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. When's judgment begin at the house of God? we got yes. a self-judgment supposed to be going on by the Word, don't we? When will the Lord judge the house of God? At the judgment seat of Christ. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, who's going to appear over here? The righteous. Is Peter looking forward to a day when the house of God will be judged? Okay, go over and look at what he says in First uh, Peter 1. Verse 15. 
He says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in fear, judges according to every man's work, what did Paul say was going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ? Every man's, like Every man's works will be judged, won't they? Okay. Um, i tell you what, just one more to show you. Did the Lord, go to Luke 19. Did the Lord Jesus Christ talk about the judgment seat of Christ? He didn't call it the judgment seat of Christ, but let's see what he says. Luke 19, 11. Luke 19, 11 says, As they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Now, think about it. What have we been taught? What have I taught you? That the kingdom, of the kingdom we say, was supposed to, the physical kingdom was supposed to appear right here, and yet because Israel killed the Messiah, it got postponed, right? Mm -hmm. Was the kingdom supposed to appear right there? No. <clears throat> He's, he's starting a kingdom called the kingdom of God, isn't he? But is it visible or invisible? Did he already Was it already planned before the cross that it wasn't going to appear? There ain't no postponement. There's no, there's no such thing. Now he says, uh, verse 12, He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hate him and sent a message after him saying, We'll not have this man reign over us. It came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. What's that sound like? When he returns, is he going to judge his servants? Is he judging them whether they're going to heaven or hell? No, he's judging them to see what kind of rewards they're going to get. Did he give them something and they could use it while he was gone? <coughs> what did the Lord commit unto us? The gospel. the gospel. Words. That's what he gave. What are we doing with them? We're going to be judged for what we do with them, won't we? Mm -hmm. Not talking heaven and hell. Don't, don't get that idea. All right. Let's just do it a little different here now. All right. Go over to uh, Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16, Paul says. Now, Paul writes this in Acts chapter 20. Is the Jerusalem church, Peter and them, all still alive and around in Acts 20? They are, right? He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, except for Peter's group. Huh. It don't say that, does it? It says his group first. That's exactly what it says. See, we take these verses most of the time to read, well, Paul had to go to the Jew first in every city. What Paul's saying there is it's the gospel that saves. It's been saving the Jews first. Now it's saving Gentiles. Mm -hmm. it, did he say the gospel was the power to everyone that believeth? Mm -hmm. Did he say, but there's another group that must believe and be baptized and endure? How could Paul say in Acts 20 that it's the power to everyone that believeth if there were some that were being saved another way? He couldn't make that statement, could he? Mm -hmm. We're going to deal with the baptism about salvation uh, probably next class. Okay? I already did some notes on it, but think about what Paul's saying there. In Acts chapter 20, what did he say was the means of salvation to everybody? The gospel of Christ. Anything added to it? Any enduring to keep it. Okay? Now, that's past salvation. That's this one, isn't it? Everybody agree that's what he's saying? It's the power of God unto salvation. All right, I just write salvation right here. Do you have to wait to get that salvation, or does it happen the moment you believe? The moment you believe. Okay? All right. Now, take that and go to Romans 13. Romans 13, 10. 
Paul says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. By the way, a lot of times people are told that under the new covenant, the law of Moses will be written in their heart. It doesn't say that. What did Jesus Christ say? All the law hangs on two, didn't it? Love God and love your neighbor. Hey, charity. He says, verse 11, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. What? The man just said, you got salvation. But he said, now our salvation is nearer than when we believe. So obviously what Paul must be saying is, well, you were saved, but you weren't really saved. You've got to endure until the end to be saved. Is that what he's saying? No, he's not. No, what's he saying? He's making a distinction between our standing and our state. That's what he's doing. He's saying, you're saved spiritually by faith. You've got it. And the day's coming when you ain't going to need faith to get it. The day's coming when you're going to be saved. Your salvation will be seen, won't it? Will it take faith to see it? From the day a person saved, what does he say we're saved by? Grace. By grace through what? Faith. Through faith. Why does it take faith to believe salvation? You can't see it. You can't see it, touch it, no. But what's going to happen the day you get your new body? You're going to have physical salvation, won't you? So there's a past salvation from hell spiritual. There's an ongoing salvation that we need to save ourselves from bad doctrine. And Paul said we need to have our mind transformed. We need to save ourselves from... Look, there's all kind of things that a saved person can get into that will cost them at the judgment seat of Christ, isn't there? But is there a future physical salvation? Yeah. Then it's in three different stages here, isn't it? Doesn't mean you're not saved. It means you're saved by faith here and your hope of salvation will appear here. You won't need faith and hope. You'll see it. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Alright, let's do it one more way. Go to, uh, tell you what, go to Hebrews 5. Let's see if the Hebrew epistles agree with this. Verse 8. <clears throat> Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Now, what kind of salvation is it if it ain't eternal? That ain't no salvation, Ooh. is it? Eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That obey is also translated believe. Disobedience is translated unbelief. Same word. Alright, so did the writer of Hebrews just say here they have eternal salvation? Mm -hmm. okay. Which salvation is he talking about? First. This one, right? Okay, now take that and go over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1. This is another set of uh, verses that get, that get uh, twisted. twisted. Yeah, there you go. Alright, first off, let's just start from verse 1. He says, Peter. An apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, don't chew on that for a while, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect. Are they elect? As Paul say, you're elect. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He, I've got a real good friend that, he, look, y'all know when you got one verse that's got your thinking tied down, and there'll be a hundred verses that say one thing, and one verse that appears to say something else, and what's our nature? To fight the one verse. Mm -hmm. What do you reckon we ought to fight? The hundred or the one? We ought to believe the hundred and see what we're missing about the one. Hey, I got a real good friend and he was telling me that day. He said, well, Peter and them were, were only saved. They had to endure. But God knew who was going to endure by his foreknowledge. Huh? You talk about taking the long way around the barn. Did Paul say me and you were saved by the foreknowledge of God? He did, didn't he? All right, now watch. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. Were they set aside by the Spirit? How did me and you get saved? Same way. What is this being set aside by the Spirit? It's baptized by the Holy Spirit. Put into Christ, right? Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. What is it that's procured your salvation? The blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. How in the world could you have peace if you had to endure? No. 
you wouldn't have peace. How could you have peace if you had to keep Moses' law? You couldn't. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, not according to their works now, hath begotten us again. Are these people born again? Do you think God gave them the new birth and later will take it away because they don't endure? That's a mistake, isn't it? I mean, do these people need to be born again, then died and born again, and die, born again? If God gave them the Spirit, are they born again? Yes. Is God going to kill them? Yeah. Revelation says those that are born of the Spirit, second death, you ain't got to worry about it, do you? Mm -hmm. Now watch what he says next. Hath begotten us again unto a lively, that's living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Would you be able to have the hope if your works were involved in maintaining it? No. no. Watch next. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Is their inheritance reserved? Mm -hmm. You think God reserved it and there's a chance that they're going to lose it? Watch the next verse. You who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, did the man just go through a whole list of things describing what they've got? Yes. And then he said there's a salvation that's going to be what at the last time? Revealed. What's revealed mean? Folks, when will your salvation be revealed? At the second coming. How, why isn't it revealed right now? Because it's in you. The treasure's in a vessel, right? If somebody said, prove to me that you're saved, there ain't but one proof you've got. What is it? Words, Words in a book. What if they say, I don't believe that book? Well, I can't prove it to you. I, I got nothing I can prove to you, right? But, will those unbelievers need proof on the resurrection morning? Your salvation will be revealed, won't it? Mm -hmm. He didn't say they would be saved spiritually from hell at the second coming. He said their salvation would be revealed, didn't it? Mm -hmm. well, let's read on Wherein you greatly rejoice. How in the world could they rejoice if they had all this enduring to do? Though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Are me and you going through the same type of a trial of service? Yes. Yeah, folks, we are. When will this being found blameless or being at the judgment seat of Christ. Now he says, verse 8, Whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving, what is that? What tense? Present tense. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Did they have it right there? Yeah. Yeah. Read on. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. This is the new covenant. Now he goes all through this. Now watch verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is he telling them to hope to the end? What did Paul say mean you need to do? Hope. What is our hope? It's resurrection. It's the hope of Israel's our hope, isn't it? It doesn't say you people can be saved if you live without sin, if you endure, if you do this, if you do. He never once said that. But we read it and that's what we take from it because we every time we see the word salvation, we want to make it this, don't we? Does that make sense so far? Okay, let's do it one more time. Um, tell you what, go over to... Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, is there any doubt that Paul said that we have salvation? No, he said it point blank, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, he said it a bunch of times. Now, watch what he says in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. He says in verse 9, or verse 8 to be better, let us who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Is that, are you saved? Well, I hope so. Yeah. No. Okay. Hope has to do with what again? 
resurrection. Watch him keep it in context. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation from what? Wrath. wrath. Folks, are you appointed unto wrath? No. What's going to happen to you? You're going to be saved from the wrath. What's going to be saved from the wrath? Your body. If you're still alive, you'll be saved from it. And if not, when the time comes, the dead come up and go, don't they? The picture is back here. We've done this so many times lately. Here's Noah's Ark. For all them years, however long it took him to build, what was Noah saying to the people? Man, the bottom's fixing to fall out. God's fixing to get them, right? And anybody that believed Noah, what could they have done? They could have went through the door onto the boat. Once God sealed that door up, was there any getting on there? Yeah. What happened after He sealed the door up? Well, he poured out wrath. Mm -hmm. Did He get no in them? No. no. Why not? They, 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 they were sealed up in the boat. What do y'all reckon that boat represents? Body of Christ. Body of Christ. Yeah. I mean, what are we supposed to be telling people today? Folks, there's coming a day when God is going to judge this world and it's going to be worse than this even come close to Hey, this was flood with water. You're talking about eyes melting in the sockets over here, right? Okay. What's the only way you can make it through that? Jesus. You're going to have to be in Christ, sealed up in Christ, taken care of, right? All right, go over to, uh, wow. let's do it with redemption, okay? Go to Ephesians 1.7. I hope that this ain't just muddying it up for people online, but y'all, just check all the scriptures out. Don't, I know this will go against what, what we've been told and whatnot, but just check the Scriptures. In Ephesians 1.7, now watch Paul. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Did he just say, you've got redemption? Yes. Mm -hmm. Alright, I'm going to write it right here. When did you get this redemption? The moment you trusted Jesus Christ, you believed on the Lord as your Savior, you've got that redemption. The man just said it, didn't he? Come down to verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until... The redemption of the purchased possession. What? Well, Paul must have been drunk when he wrote this letter, huh? He mm -hmm. said, you've got the redemption. And then he said, God gave us the seal of the Spirit of promise until redemption. Well, what in the world redemption is he talking about? New body. Physical redemption, right? Okay. From the time you're saved to the time you get physically redeemed, what did God give you? The Holy Spirit of promise. Right? Think about it. We've done the little kid before. Alright? We're going to Disney World. Boom! That kid heard a promise. It gets inside their head and it starts a whole life of its own, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. From that moment forward, his friends say, prove it. Can he prove it? Mm -hmm. What's he got? Word. He's got none but words, Right? Somebody says, prove that you're going to go be with the Lord. Well, I'll show you right here. If they don't believe this book, I can't prove it to you. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So between here and over here, God gave us earnest. Earnest money means I'm going to carry through with the deal. What is the earnest that you've got from God? you got a promise. Don't y'all think about that. The Holy Spirit of promise. What did God say to Abraham? I'm going to give you a child out of your own loins. And what did Abraham say? That's it. Lord, you said it. You, that's it. I got it. Didn't he? If you reckon any of his friends said, prove it. I didn't think how he'd go about trying to prove it. But my point is, what was he hanging everything on? Faith. His word. God promised, right? Did God give us his word? Then the only people that have this promise are what? The ones that believe His Word. You've got to take Him at His Word. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. See, this salvation is pleasing to God to give to you as a gift because you've got no proof other than God's Word. It pleases God to give you this salvation. It will thrill me and you to gain this salvation. 
Me and you obtain this salvation by faith and faith alone. Me and you'll see this salvation. I won't have to wonder in this day. Somebody say, is Chris saved? Well, there he is. He's right there. Will anybody have to wonder? Mm -mm. So then, are you redeemed? Absolutely. The Bible says Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe what the Bible says. Well, prove you're redeemed. I can't, but hang around. I'll prove it over mm -hmm. here. Now, in between, I can prove it with this book. Right? Okay, now that's redemption. Now, let's do it one more way. So that in between, if we take him at his word, he'll give us the peace to endure this shipwreck. That's exactly a good, good way to put it. In between, you and I are operating by faith. And what does Paul tell us we need to do? Grow in grace and faith, right? I mean, you get to a point where, think about what God tried to show the Israelites. He told them he would deliver them, and he's going to bring them into the land. He delivered them, and in between delivering them and bringing them into the land, did he supply everything they needed? Yeah. But did they ever learn to trust him? Mm -hmm. Never did, did they? Folks, mm -hmm. you can trust the Lord. Oh, yeah. you, you can't trust anything else, but you can trust the Lord. Now let's just uh, look at it one other way. Go back to Romans uh, 8. Now do y'all see how if we were not careful, we would think Paul was telling us that we had to endure to the end to be saved, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. It ain't no different than what Peter and them say. And it's just the wording is a little different and people jump on it. Remember in the context of the tribulation, are there going to be some people that are going to live through it? Yes. He said, he that endures until the end shall be saved. What's he trying to say? There are going to be some people left alive. What's going to be saved? Flesh. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay, now watch what he says in Romans 8, 14. Paul says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. All right. Are you a son of God? Yes. <coughs> now, watch how you got to be a son of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, ye have received the spirit of adoption. How'd you get to be a son of God? Adoption. Is it something you've got? Yes. Yes, right? Come on down to verse uh, 22. For we know that the whole creation, I mean the earth, every creature on it, including our physical bodies, we know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Does that sound like your body? Yes. Does it sound like your neighbor's body? Yes. Does it sound like the earth? The whole thing's coming, falling apart, isn't it? He, Chris has been sick for a week. You reckon Chris was laying around there won't moaning and groaning? I feel for Dean. I can imagine what the last week's been like, right? He, but my point is that's what life's like. Now watch verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. Hold on a minute. Didn't he say we had the adoption? Mm -hmm. But he said, now we're waiting for the adoption. Well, what adoption are you waiting for? To wit, the redemption of your body. Do you redeem spiritually here? Adopted spiritually? Son of God spiritually? When will it become physical? Second coming. Make sense? Alright, now let's see if we can. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ told these men the same thing. Alright, go over to... Uh, I tell you what, first off, while we're right here, go over to Galatians 4. We want to see if Peter and them are in the same exact situation as us. Okay? Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Now, was Peter under the law? What is to redeem them that were under the law? Is that already redeemed? Yes. Was, so was Peter redeemed? How was Peter and his people redeemed? By the blood of Jesus Christ, just like me and you, right? Same redemption me and you talk about. Now Paul says it right there, but go over to 1 Peter and watch Peter say it himself. 1 Peter 1.18 Alright, 1 Peter 1.18 says, 
For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Does Peter say they were redeemed by the blood of Christ? Mm. Did they have that? They got it, don't they? Okay, Let's go to Hebrews real quick. Let's see if the writer of Hebrews agrees. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9.11 But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood, He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Did they have it? Mm -hmm. Folks, how long is eternal redemption? Now, how are you going to lose that? Okay. Does anything in there about enduring? Mm -mm. Eternal redemption was provided how? By the blood of the cross, mm -hmm. wasn't it? So, do they have it according to Peter and the Hebrew writer? Yeah. They got it, don't they? Okay, flip over to Luke 21. Undoubtedly, the Lord must make a big mistake over here. Okay, Luke 21, let's see what he says. Luke 21, 25. I know y'all know these uh, verses. There's a song about this verse. He says, There shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the wave roaring. Sound like the sixth seal, doesn't it? Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power or with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now hold on. Is he telling them that you're going to be able to be saved over here when you see me coming? Or is he telling them when you see me coming, lift up your heads because your bodies are fixing to be redeemed? Yeah what he's telling them, isn't it? How did Paul say he was waiting on the redemption of his body? Folks, is there any difference in that? No. Not a lick of difference, okay? So every time we see words in Scripture, salvation, saved, and all, don't pounce on it. Keep it in the context and read it and see what, what uh, thing he's talking about being saved from, right? So we're saved by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. The moment we trust Jesus Christ died for our sins, folks, you're saved. If you believe on Christ, you're saved. But then, you're still on this earth. And you're going to have to stick to the Word of God and you're going to have to watch and be on guard against things that will harm you, won't you? Mm -hmm. The most harmful thing is what? Doctrine. The flesh. The doctrines of the flesh, literally. Now, who's behind them? Satan. Satan. Paul said we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. What's the only way you can fight bad doctrine? Good With true doctrine. So we fight this battle, don't we? And finally, one day, we drop dead. If we don't drop dead, if we drop dead, your spirit will go be with the Lord. If we don't drop dead and you happen to remain or endure until the Lord shouts, what will happen? You'll be changed that flat. I don't know what it'll look like, but you'll get your new body. Those that are dead will be raised up and get them. Everybody will be shown forth, won't they? Watch what Paul calls this. One more verse. And say we'll be like him. Be like him. Yeah. Romans 8, where we just were. In Romans 8, Paul's already said that we're sons of God, hadn't he? But in verse 18, he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, there's some of the salvation you've got to be go, get through these sufferings, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Did he say you are a son of God? But where is this at right now? It's inside your flesh. Kingdom of God's within you, isn't it? When will the sons of God be manifest? The second coming. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions?